Hi, everyone. I'm David Chadwick, and in case you don't know, I'm one of the pastors here at Moments of Hope Church. It's my privilege every week to walk you through verse by verse the book of Revelation, which is a magnificent book explaining end times. Revelation 1 says we're blessed when we read through out loud the book of Revelation. I hope you felt blessed as I have indeed as well. Today is Revelation 17. At first blush, a rather difficult chapter to understand, but once I unfold it for you, I think you'll understand it in great detail and really appreciate it. Before you get into Revelation 17, you need to take a step back into what's going on during what's called the Great Tribulation time period. Before God pours out his bold judgment wraths that we've been looking at over the last several weeks, we look back at the beginning of the Great Tribulation time period when the Antichrist steps on the scene, and one of the ways he brings about peace in the midst of chaos is, first of all, forming a one-world religion. And in that one-world religion, he brings all of the religions together, brings unity throughout all of the world, and that helps bring peace amidst all of the chaos. Then we'll see next week The other thing the Antichrist does is he brings a one-world government, but I'll wait for next week to explain that in greater detail. Revelation 17 explains what's commonly called the great prostitute Babylon, or this one-world religious system that the Antichrist used for his own purposes in controlling all of the world. So with that as an introduction, let's move to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, so remember that out of the temple in heaven, God told seven angels with seven bowls to have seven bowls filled with his wrath, and they are the sevenfold bowl wrath judgments that we've been looking at over the last several weeks. One of those angels, we don't know which one with which wrath, but one of them comes to John and said to him, come I, the angel, will show you, John, the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. This is the great prostitute Babylon, the one world religious system. And by being seated on many waters, that simply means that the whole world bought the lie. The whole world followed this one world religious system. Verse 2 with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. Well, we're going to get to these kings and these leaders who followed the Antichrist, more specifically 10 of them in the end days, and they all, along with the people themselves, notice that Revelation always calls humans on earth who've rebelled against God earth dwellers, as opposed to those of us who love Jesus, we are eternal city dwellers. And that's the difference that John makes throughout the book of Revelation. And what is the sexual immorality that this angel shows John? Is it literal sexual immorality? Well, if you know your Bible, you know that constantly sexual immorality is used as a byword, if you were, to explain the whole idea of spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication, spiritual worldliness, paganism, occultism, rebellion against God as being the one true God and following him in his one true world religion, trying to adopt anything and everything that they want in order to do anything and everything that they want. And so with this particular antichrist, you're going to see world leaders and everyone in the world commit not literal sexual immorality, although that's one of the rebellious ways of God that we're witnessing even in our culture today. Um, It is a symbol for paganism, idolatry of worshiping the creation over the creator. Again, a one world religious system that is rebellion against God and worshiping the things of this earth, particularly the worship of the antichrist himself who desired that more than anything else. Then look at verse 3. And he, the angel, carried me, that's John, away in in the spirit into a wilderness. Stop there for a second. We know in the Bible that sometimes God, maybe through an angel, maybe through the Holy Spirit himself, will carry humans to a different place in the spiritual world. We know that Paul did that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He was lifted up into the third heaven, and he was able to see things there in the spirit that he had never been able to see before. And here is John being lifted up in the spirit 
by this angel into a wilderness, interestingly. Now, why a wilderness? Folks, because God does some of his greatest work in the wilderness. Some of you have told me that you've gone through wilderness times recently, and later you've told me, looking back after you've gone out of the wilderness, that was some of the richest, deepest, most spiritually blessing times I've ever been through in all of my life. Why the wilderness? Right after the giving of the Ten Commandments and the parting of the Red Sea, what did God do with the Israelites? He led them into the wilderness. Jesus, after his baptism, when he hears those most glorious words, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him. And right after that, it says, and the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. With the Israelites and with Jesus, God the Father was doing some of his deepest, richest work in their hearts when they had no distractions, when they had nothing else except God himself, God was able to deal with their hearts in a profound way. So praise God for the wilderness if you're in one right now, because if you really go to Jesus and trust in him and don't complain and don't gripe like the Israelites ultimately did and God had to deal with them, God will do his deepest, richest work in you and show you aspects of Jesus he's never shown you before. So this angel takes John, interestingly, in the spirit into a wilderness where he's not distracted, where he can understand this message, for it is a very important message to understand. And I, John, saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. Real quickly, I'll explain the seven heads and ten horns later on in the text. They're mentioned a couple of other times. But here John sees a woman. And isn't it interesting in in Revelation 12 that a woman rises up, and she is the nation of Israel who gives birth to the child Jesus and is persecuted by the dragon dragon, Satan. Well, here's another woman that rises up, and this woman is a powerful scarlet creature. Now, I think scarlet probably there is purposeful because it is the signal of blood, because this woman causes bloodshed in her power. Uh, This woman is the religious system that I have been talking to you about, and, and she is the one who has blasphemous names and again had seven horns and seven heads and ten horns. Well, this woman who rode on scarlet, who killed the martyrs of the church, who killed great tribulation Christians, also had blasphemous names attached to her. So in this new religious system, there are going to be those honorifics, those who are heads of the system itself, who are going to be given names that only God should have himself. Names like your honor or sovereign Lord or your majesty, names like that, which are blasphemous in the sight of God. Remember Jesus said, you should call no one on earth your father, because that's something reserved solely for the Father in heaven. People ask me all the time, should we call you Dr. Chadwick? I I have an earned doctorate. Uh, I have an honorary doctorate as well. Um, They say, should we call you Reverend Chadwick, because I'm a reverend set apart for the purpose of ministry in the church. And Should I call you Pastor David? And I always answer the same way. I always say, why not just call me David? Don't don't put a title on my name that lifts me higher than I should be. I'm a sinner saved by grace, just like you are called to the ministry of the gospel, which I think gives me a position of honor and privilege. I get that, but it's not to be used to control people, but to serve people. And, And here in this one world religious system, there's going to be a lot of blasphemous names attached to the leaders of that system. And you're going to see that particularly it had seven heads and 10 horns again that we'll look at in just a moment. Uh, Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple. So this one world religious system was arrayed in purple. That is the color of power. If you know your symbology in the Bible, purple is the color of power. It's what kings would wear to show their power. And also scarlet, which is a symbol of royalty, which, which means that this system is going to have probably a hierarchy of those in control who control other people who have power and also royalty that are a part of their life and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls that there's going to be a lot of money in this system they're going to be able to control a lot of money in the world Um, there's an old joke about uh, Peter at the gate where the lame man is asking him to speak to him so he can walk again and Peter said to him, 
gold and silver have I not, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And someone purportedly read that section of scripture and said, you know, I, it doesn't sound like some churches have the ability to say that anymore. The truth is, even today, we see churches that are extremely wealthy, have all kinds of beauty and glory in their midst, and this final world religious system will resemble that kind of church. Holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. So in her hand is this cup, which is usually given for people to drink from. It's a golden cup, again, symbolizing the wealth of this one world religious system. And abominations are going to be a part of this one world religious system. God in heaven is going to look down, and we know the word in abominations in the scripture is a word of decadence, it's a word of lawlessness, it's a word of rebellion. So this system is rebelling against the one true God, again, worshiping the things of creation rather than the creator, and the impurities of her sexual immorality. Again, not literal sexual immorality sexual immorality. It could be a part of it, but it's probably more talking about this adulterous rebellion against God, worshiping paganism and occultism, and then what flows out of that, all kinds of impurities in the people who follow along. See, if you reject God as the sovereign Lord and you start coming up with systems, with rites and rituals, eventually it's all about you. And if you try to control people, then you try to use people for your glory. And that's when all kinds of immoralities and godlessness come into the picture. Let me just say this real quickly. Dear friends, there are not thousands of world's religions. There are basically two world religions. There is one that is you have a right relationship with God on the basis of your works. Secondly, and the only other one of all the other world's religions that doesn't have that as a part of it is the Christian faith, which says you have a relationship with God based on what his work on the cross has done for you. you. You see, the Christian faith is not a religion. It's not a system. It's a relationship with the living God of this universe through Jesus. And I don't know where you are. Whatever church you may go through, you think you've got to go through all the rites and rituals in order for God to be approved. Nothing could be farther from the truth. You need just to go to Jesus. It's in that relationship that you know you're loved and accepted and forgiven, and you have the gift of eternal life. So in these two world systems that we're seeing here at the end of the age, there's this one global religion that has as its desire a system of wealth and power and honor and dignity and all kinds of things that allow people to control other people, then rites and rituals that other people have to go through in order to feel like they've earned acceptance in the religious system. And juxtaposed to that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you look at all of the world's systems, Taoism, Hinduism, uh, Sikhism, Confucianism, Islam, even Judaism, it's all the laws that we have to go through to earn God's favor. In Hinduism, for example, it's karma, and you get what you deserve because your life is based on your previous works. And the only religion that is juxtaposed against all of those is the Christian faith, which is not about karma, not about law, not about obedience in order to earn righteousness, works righteousness. It's about grace. That one word that describes the Christian faith, it's grace, that we can't earn it. It's given to us as a free gift. So in this last global world religion, it's all about works. It's all about rights. It's all about rituals. It's all about hierarchy. It's all about wealth. It's all about power. And it could not be farther from the truth of God's word and what he desires. Verse five, and on her forehead was written a name of mystery. So this is on the forehead, the name of this great prostitute, Babylon. And interestingly, during Roman times and indeed throughout the history of the world, prostitutes oftentimes would wear headbands with their literal names written on it. So here we have the literal name of this great prostitute, Babylon, written on her forehead so we can know her. And here are the indicators of who she is. First of all, she's a mystery. She's a mystery. And, and through the history of the world, you've always had mystery religions, mystery cults. In Jesus' day, it was Gnosticism and beyond. And Gnosticism was a mystery cult that only a few understood, and they controlled the others by their knowledge of what they knew, but uh, nobody else could know it because it was solely given to them. But biblically, a mystery is not like solving a mystery of a murder that you might see on a movie or a television show, etc. A mystery, biblically, is something that's now being made known. So this angel is making known to John this one world global religion. This mystery is now being revealed, and here is the continued name, 
Babylon the Great. So let's stop there. Babylon the Great. Babylon flows from the name Babel, B-A-B-E-L, the Tower of Babel found in Genesis 11. But before the Tower of Babel was founded, you're introduced in Genesis 10 to a character by the name of Nimrod. Uh, His name means mighty hunter, but it could also mean mighty hunter of men's souls. Interestingly, this Nimrod is also named a rebel in the Bible, and many people think he is the first type of the Antichrist revealed in the Bible. He is the first one to rebel against the authority of God to build something for his glory, for his self, and has to do with a one-world religious system. In building the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, he makes it very clear along with the people who are there with him, their desire in building this ziggurat, which is a fancy name for a multi-tiered tower that goes broad at the base, a little more at the next base, a little more at the next base, up and up and up, stepwise to one tower at the top where there would be a high priest or priestesses who would worship in that highest place. Well, Nimrod, along with the people, decide to build a tower, a ziggurat, the Tower of Babel, to make a great name for themselves to make a great name for themselves. You see, it's all about them, a religious system that exalts creation over the creator. And in this ziggurat, you see at the top the priest and the high priestesses worshiping the zodiac, the the new age religions that we know today, astrology, and other man-made pagan occultic religions. They would worship the stars and how they apply to their lives. Again, it was a worship of creation rather than the creator. Interestingly, Nimrod's wife was named Sararamus, and Semiramis was a high priestess, and many think she may have been the one who came up with this whole astrology, new age occultism that existed with the Tower of Babel. And again, she was Nimrod's wife. And we see with her and Nimrod, they had a son named Tammuz, but Semiramis said repeatedly that Tammuz was a miraculous conception, that it did not happen by human means. And there was some kind of conception that occurred miraculously for him to enter the world. And then as Tammuz grew up, Tammuz was killed, gored by a boar, dead, and then by the powers of this new religion that Semiramis had come up with, was raised back to new life and became then the focus of a lot of people's worship in that day because of his apparent resurrection. Isn't that fascinating, folks? that the whole godless, pagan, occultic world's religion, its system of idolatry, rebelling against God, had as its foundation a mimicry of the Father and giving birth to a virgin, Mary, the Son, Jesus, who was killed and raised from the dead to be worshipped. I think Satan knows the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus from the fall in Genesis 3, and he's trying anything and everything that he can do to throw people off in humanity from worshiping the Jesus he knows who is coming, going to die, and be raised again and ascend to heaven and give people the gift of eternal life and one day smash his head and retake his kingdom that Adam had given to Satan. Jesus owns everything and he's going to come back one day and reclaim that in his second coming. So that kind of worship, that kind of mimicry was going on even at Babel. And then at the end, what happens, of course, God sees that all of them speak the same language, that they can do anything if they're together, molded in their unity to accomplish great things for themselves. So what does God do? He scatters them all over the world, and they find each other who speak each other's languages. And then finally, they do what God said to do, be fruitful and multiply, where they were trying to gather themselves in one specific locale in the plains of Shinar, uh, Genesis 11 tells us. Now, God comes down and scatters them all over the world. And where do they go? They go all over the Fertile Crescent, of course, then, but all over the world. And what do they take with them? They take with them the godless pagan religions of Semiramis, and they start practicing those religions themselves. One of them being in the nation of Babel, which becomes Babylon. And in Babylon, if you read closely when King Nebuchadnezzar ruled, 
He had a pantheon of gods with all different kinds of names, one of them being Tammuz. He was worshipped primarily in the godlessness of sexual identity and licentiousness during the month of June, a a pride month, if you will. Uh, And and what you see then in not only that system in Babylon, which then spread into the systems of Assyria and, and Egypt and Greece and then Rome, it's the same gods with different names. Folks, let me say it again. It's the same godless, pagan, occultic system all over the world, just with different names. And I think you could even argue, looking at Hinduism and Taoism and Buddhism and Sikhism and all that, it's the same kind of pantheon, like in Hinduism, 330 million gods who all are gods and that our desire is to one day become like them. It's just another form of, I think, the Nimrod Semiramis understanding of paganism and occultism traced back to the Garden of Eden. So if you understand that, this verse might become alive to you like never before. The name on the forehead was Babylon the Great from the Tower of Babel to Babylon, which then expanded those religious understandings to different nations all over the face of the earth. It had been scattered at the Tower of Babel. And then interestingly, not only was Babylon the Great written on her head because that's the great religions of the world everywhere, the mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. This Tower of Babel experience with Nimrod and Semiramis, interestingly, is the mother of all the other world's religions. She's the mother of the prostitutes, of the false religions, of the godless idolatry of this world world. And all of the earth's abominations, all of the earth's false religions, all of the earth's worship of the creation rather than the creator are found in Genesis 11 from Nimrod and Semiramis to Babylon, the increase of the pantheon of gods, which then is expressed in all of the major religions practically throughout all of the world. Then verse 6, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So this is going back to the Antichrist, one world religion. And when it is formed, the one thing it's going to hate more than anything else in the world, this religion that's drunk, almost gleeful. Remember in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit poured upon the church at 9 o'clock in the morning, many people thought they were drunk because they were so gleeful, they were so joyful. Well, this One world religion is going to be so gleeful, so joyful, because it is killing the Christians. It's drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. It's going to find great joy in eliminating all of those people who say, Jesus alone is Lord. Jesus is the creator of everything. Jesus alone is worthy to be worshipped. And when they have that counterintuitiveness against their system, they're going to want to kill the messenger. And now let me mention real quickly here, in case you haven't heard this, the church is gone by now. The, the church of Jesus Christ has been raptured into heaven before the tribulation ever began. These are just martyrs who've come to faith in Jesus during the seven years of the great tribulation through the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, through the two witnesses in Revelation 11 in Jerusalem who share the gospel over and over again and cannot be harmed by God's protection, by the flying angel that goes all over the world and proclaims the gospel to the remotest parts of the world, and to those who've come to faith in Jesus who then proclaim the gospel to their friends and family members. They're going to come to faith as well. It's not the church. It's not going to be the church. The church is gone. The church has its system and its structure, its worship of coming together. That's not going to be able to happen here because the Antichrist and this system of world religion, and we'll see next week the system of world government, is going to so hate them, it's going to want to persecute them. They're hiding in order just to live. Many of them will be martyred. Many of them will survive into the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign after Jesus' second coming that we'll look at in Revelation 19 through 22. But this woman, this world system of government, enjoys killing the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled greatly. Now, don't think that's one of those John looking at this woman and going, wow, what a woman. I mean, she's kind of attractive or whatever. This term marveled means astonishment that when he saw this one world uh, system of religion killing Christians, he he was astonished. He just just couldn't understand it. And how do we know that's the meaning? Because look at verse 7, but the angel said to me, why do you marvel? Why are you astonished at this? I will tell you the mystery of the woman. 
I'll tell you now and make clear to you what's going on with this woman, with this false religious system. And of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. So we see here that the beast, we know from previous verses in Revelation, especially chapter 13, that the beast is the Antichrist. And so here, the beast is like the horse that the woman is riding. It seems like the religious system controls the beast. But in reality, as we'll see in a moment, the beast, the Antichrist, was merely using the woman, using this religious system for his own purposes as he took control of the world amidst all of its chaos to bring order and peace so he could ultimately take complete control. Verse 8, the beast that you saw that was and is not and is about to rise. I'm going to explain that to you in a verse that's upcoming to make that really more clear to you. Let me read it again. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. So you're going to see, John, this Antichrist come on the scene, and he's going to control this one religious system. And look at the next words, and the dwellers on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundations of the world will marvel to see the beast. Now, these earth dwellers, as they're called, remember in Revelation, earth dwellers are simply people who don't believe in Jesus. We are heavenly dwellers. We're members of the heavenly city, citizens of heaven. Well, this Antichrist who comes out of nowhere has as his ultimate destination destruction or perdition or hell, and all of the people on earth who haven't had their names written in the book of life of Jesus, who don't believe in Jesus, they're just going to marvel at the beast. They're going to be astonished at the beast with all of his solutions to all of the chaos that exists in the world. Now, look at this, next words, because it was and is not, and is to come. What's going to really prove powerful for the beast is during the first three and a half years, he's going to set up this religious system. People are going to marvel at him. He's going to be declared the greatest of the great, but then he's going to have an experience halfway through his three and a half to seven, his three and a half years, which lead then to seven years, at the end of three and a half years, he, there's going to be an apparent assassination attempt on his life. We see that earlier in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and he's going to apparently die, and then thirdly, he's going to apparently be raised from the dead, who was and is not and is to come. Was he lived, is not died, and is to come, is raised back to life. And at that moment, folks, with the false prophet's help, and I think it was an apparent resurrection because I don't think Satan can raise anybody from the dead. I think God controls all life and death. There's going to be an apparent resurrection, and the false prophet's going to be the best PR man in the history of the world. He's going to make it seem like an actual resurrection as, once again, Satan just wants to mimic Jesus, and that resurrection seemingly gives the Antichrist great power. And at that moment, at the three-and-a-half-year mark, that's when the Antichrist declares that he is God, and he goes into the Holy of Holies in the temple, and an image is built of him, maybe by the false prophet himself. Don't know exactly what it'll look like. Maybe it's an AI interpretation. We're not sure. But the whole world is demanded now to worship the Antichrist. And those who worship him must take the mark of the beast in order to buy and sell. So at that moment, three and a half years into his reign, he controls all of the world. He was, is not, is to come. His life, death, and resurrection allow him to take control now of all of the world. Now look at verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. In other words, the angel is saying to John, you've got to really seek your heart for great wisdom now to understand what all of this means and especially what's about to come and what it means. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, these seven heads, I think, are the great nations that have existed before John's time period that were affected by the Jewish or the Christian witness. And we know what those seven nations are. They are Egypt, they are Assyria, they are Babylon, they are the Medo-Persians, they are Greece, uh, they are Rome, and they are the revised Roman Empire, and that's the seven that we are talking about with, with these seven heads. The head means rulership. You know, I'm, I'm the head of state of America. I, I'm the head of my family. It means 
rulership. And the seven mountains, some people think that means seven hills, and this is all in reference, especially as you go back to the hierarchy and the colors, that this is all about the Roman Catholic Church, and it is a part of the Antichrist system. I can't go there. There are too many beloved, wonderful, born-again Catholics whom I know. Will the Roman Catholic Church be a part of the great apostasy? I think so, along with other Christian sects and denominations that have become milk toast and mediocre at best. But I'll get to that in just a second. So it's not seven hills, though, because that's the seven hills of Rome. And, and people think that's what this is talking about, the seven hills of Rome. And if you look at literature, Rome is built on seven hills. This though doesn't say seven hills. It says seven mountains. And if you look biblically, what is a mountain? It is a sign of a kingdom. It's a sign of strength. So these seven heads are seven kingdoms on which the woman is seated, who has been a part of their abomination of godless systems in their religious worldview. And you see that in the Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian, Roman, and of course in the Antichrist great system, you see all of these abominations of desolation taking place that were a part of, I think, Nimrod's original uh, adoption of godless, paganist, occultic worship. And, verse 10, they all, there are also seven kings, five of whom who fallen, one is and the other has not yet come. Now, now, what in the world does that mean? Okay, so there's seven kings, seven kingdoms that I just mentioned to you. Five of them have fallen. And, and we know by John's day in 95 AD, as he is experiencing this vision on the island of Patmos, we know five of these kingdoms that have some kind of Judeo-Christian influence upon them, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Medo-Persian, and Grecian empires, they've all gone away. They, they don't exist anymore. Um, so, so we know that that is the case that is going on right here, five of whom have fallen. One is, well, what's that? Well, well it's John's Roman Empire. In 95 AD, the Roman Empire still exists. Well, the other has not yet come. What is that? That's the Daniel 2 prophecy of there's going to be yet another kingdom that arises, mostly we think as biblical scholars, out of the former Holy Roman Empire, probably in Europe, maybe more centered in Western Europe. There are going to be 10 nations that arise along with the Antichrist in these days. That's yet to come. It hasn't happened yet. For many of us, as we look around, we say, hmm, maybe it could come in some kind of European conglomeration of unity. And interestingly, that there are 10 toes that are part of those 10 kingdoms that Daniel saw in his prophecy in Daniel 2. And he said, but they're not as strong because they are mixed with clay and iron. And folks, I can't help but wonder if that isn't going to be some kind of 10-headed nation nation empire that rises up out of Europe, but they're not going to be that strong. They're going, to, they're going to be a mixture of the iron of Rome, which is Western civilization and our understanding of laws and our understanding of family, our understanding of obedience and all those kind of things, but they're going to be mixed with clay. And you can't help but note the number of immigrants that have flowed into Europe and Western Europe right now. And right now you can see in, let's take one example, in England and Scotland and Ireland right now, all kinds of rebellion are breaking places. People who've lived in those nations for a long period of time don't want their Western civilization to go away. And they're seeing the Muslims take over everything. And there's all kinds of conflict going on in the streets right now as they are fighting one another. And if that fighting continues over time and the nations come out of that mixture of Muslim and Western civilization, you can see how weak the They'll be. They're not going to be strong if they don't have a moral consensus, a common humanity on which they have based their past and look forward to the future. Uh, so you look at this and say, one is yet to come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while, which is the eighth kingdom that we're going to look at in just a moment in verse 11, as for the beast that was and is not, the Antichrist who was and then died, was raised from the dead, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven. What does that mean? That, that out of this seventh one where there are these ten kings coming together with the Antichrist, for the first three and a half years, they're going to rule powerfully together, but then the eighth one is the second three and a half years where the Antichrist declares himself to be God. And then you're going to see later on that he deals with these ten kings in a powerful, insignificant way. Uh, 
that he does not want them around in any possible way. But it's only going to last for a little while, for about three and a half years. Then verse 11, as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth and it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. That at the valley of Armageddon, in that great final conflict, when the Antichrist gathers all the nations of the earth, the ten that follow him closely in every nation on the face of the earth, as the Euphrates dries up, we looked at it a couple of weeks ago, and these demon gods go to the kings all over the world, to the kings of the Far East, and say, come invade with us. They can get now across the Euphrates River easily in order to attack Israel. They're all going to come, and God's going to intervene at the last minute and save Israel, save his people, and they're all going to go to destruction. The Antichrist and all the people who have followed him. Verse 12, and the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. So ten kings from a ten-person recomprised European enterprise come together. They're with the beast. They have authority with the beast in the first half of this with the one world religious system. They're going to seemingly be ruling with him. In the second half, he takes complete control over it, and they're only going to rule with him for one hour for just a very short time together with the beast. Verse 13, these are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So they have unity among themselves, but they finally realize that the Antichrist is the one in control, and they handle, hand over all authority to the Antichrist, especially during that last second three and a half years. Verse 14, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So these 10 kings, but especially with the Antichrist, they give him all authority. They start doing war against all the Christians, all the Jews. And interestingly, bottom line, Jesus wins. He conquers them all because Jesus, not these world systems, these wrong religious governmental systems, Jesus alone is Lord of lords and King of kings. And, and when he returns, by the way, in his second coming, he comes with the holy angels. He comes with you and me and well, as well. Who are we? Well, there are three words that define us here. We're first of all called. In eternity, we are called. Did you know if you love Jesus that before this world was ever formed, God called you? God knew that he wanted you on his team. And then in this world, you realize you're chosen and I know I had to make that decision myself. It's a mystery for me to totally understand, but I just know before I ever chose God, God chose me, that I'm chosen. And what that does is not increase my pride, it increases my humility, that the Lord God of this universe would want David Chadwick on his team, me with all of my inadequacies and in all of my failures. He wants me on his team. Yes, indeed, he does. And the one word that God wants more than any other one for us to use to describe our life in Christ, faithful, faithful so that when we meet him one day, he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So we come back with him and fight with him in this great battle and see him defeat all of the Antichrist's armies, all of his kings, all of his dominions, all of his minions. Verse 18, and the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So, so the waters are people that all follow the Antichrist and they're people who are multitudinous in numbers, but also they are of different nations and languages all over the world who will buy him. And verse 16, and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute that three and a half years in, the ten kings are going to support the Antichrist as he destroys this one world religious system and he takes over and declares himself to be God. They, the ten kings and the Antichrist, will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. They don't want anything to do with any kind of religious system. The Antichrist alone is to be worshipped and he'll turn on them three and a half years into it, declare himself to be God and destroy all of their structures and all of their people. Verse 17, for God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So this is so powerful, folks. Grab this. It's a key verse in all of the scripture that God's letting all of this happen. 
For those of you who worry about this next election, oh, what if so-and-so wins, and what's our world going to become, and what's happening all throughout our world? You just need to know that God has put into people's hearts those who rebel against him, those who are doing godless things. He puts it into their hearts to carry out his divine purposes. And he makes them be of one mind. He makes the religious system be of one mind. He makes the Antichrist and the Ten Kings with the religious system to all be of one mind in order to establish it amidst the chaos of the world. As the Antichrist comes on the world stage and has all of the answers, he comes up with this answer of the one world religious system to unite the world. The Ten Kings agree with it. The whole world agrees with it. And we think, how could they buy such a lie? God's behind it all. God permitted them to have this mind in their hearts. And then eventually, though, Then eventually, the ten kings hand over all the royal power to the beast because that's part of the plan as well as the beast then gives war against the Jews in Jerusalem and Israel until the second coming of Jesus comes and he protects his chosen as he promised. Verse 18, and the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. The woman that she's in the great city and she has dominion over all the kings of the earth People have thought the great city previously in Revelation is Rome. So therefore, this is all about Rome. And and really, you can see how this Antichrist is able to get everybody to buy into this one world system because the Christians have been raptured out. All of those of us who believe the Bible is true and all of us who cling tenaciously to absolute truth and objective truth, we're gone. And so what does he do? He takes all of the mushy middle in the Roman Catholic Church, in the mainline Protestant Church, um, in all of the world's religions uh, like Hinduism and Confucianism, I think even in Islam, trying to find an answer how to bring about world peace. Folks, what's going to happen is everybody in the world on their bumper sticker is going to have coexist. It's just going to be coexist. we got to find a way to live out with one another. And some people think Rome is going to be a big part of that with all of its godlessness in certain parts of its structures. Again, noting that many Roman Catholics really do love Jesus and are born again. I rather think, though, the great city just might be Babylon, rebuilt in its power. Saddam Hussein started it in Iraq. It still exists as a city today. Perhaps the Antichrist will step on the world scene and rebuild Babylon back to its former glory, and he will rule with all of his dominion, with all of his kings supporting him from Babylon. And instead of Jerusalem, which will be Jesus' place of rule, that in this godless idea of Nimrod passed on to Babylon, to all of the world's religious systems, that the Antichrist is going to set up his kingdom in the great city called Babylon. You know, we don't know exactly. I think it's going to become clearer as the days and months and years pass by. We will know, but it'll be fascinating to watch. Bottom line, dear friends, I just believe in what Psalm 33, 11 teaches. Listen to this word. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Don't worry about this election that's coming up about what's going on in the world. Uh, First of all, if you believe in Jesus, you're not going to have to worry about it at all eventually. But even then, we believe that that God is working out all his purposes as the water covers the sea, Habakkuk 2 verse 12, that everything in this world is planned by God and history is advancing toward that end. And we simply rest in the sovereign control of Almighty God who even puts his plans in the hearts of the most godless, reprobate people possible. And that should give our hearts peace, shouldn't it? God's in control. We don't need to worry about anything. Looked up the word anything in the dictionary this week. Guess what it means? Anything. Trust him. He's in control even of all that's going to happen in the end times, those last seven years with the Antichrist and all of his antics. To Jesus alone and always belongs all the glory. Amen. Let me pray with us. Father in heaven, I pray that somehow, some way your spirit would move now and touch the hearts of anybody out there that just doesn't believe or is a quasi-mushy, squishy Christian, somebody who doesn't really have any convictions, that really believes that there's no absolute truth, which couldn't be farther from the truth because, Lord, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray that those people who are watching right now who maybe have been a part of a mainline church and have bought some of the mainline craziness and ideological 
junk that's being taught today in those churches, that they would come to grips with your word and say, no, I want truth and I want truth in my heart. And the truth they should need more than anything else, Lord, is Jesus. And I pray that Jesus would enter their hearts right now. All you've got to do is say, Lord, I've messed it up. I haven't followed you faithfully. I've not been a biblical Christian. I've been a Christian that follows a denomination and a system of thought, a world's religion, not you. And I pray, Lord, they'd be convicted right now that they're not biblical Christians. I pray your Holy Spirit would convict them that they know they need to give their lives to Jesus and start reading the Word of God and place themselves under the authority of the Word of God, no matter what that may mean in all areas of life, whether it's personal and humility or whether it's the idea of gender or marriage, uh, whatever it might be, Lord, that people would put themselves under the authority of your Word and know what it says and commit themselves to it. Because first of all, if you do that right now, folks, you're going to be raptured out of this place. You're not going to have to worry about those seven years of dissonance. But I pray also for your immediate entrance into eternal life and have all the blessings of heaven right now as well. So I pray, Lord, that there are people right now who are simply bowing their heads going, Lord, I've screwed it up. I followed a, a system of religion. I have thought it's by my works that I'm saved, and I know now it's only by grace. And I give my heart to you, Lord Jesus, and I now commit myself to being a biblical Christian, of following your word, Lord. No matter what it says, I will stand for your word. I'll be a courageous Christian. I'll be a contagious Christian that others will want what I have. And I pray this in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer, please let us know so that we can help continue to nurture you in discipleship. We have several things coming up in the church that you should start going to. Our four areas of discipleship, scripture, theology, wholeness, and outreach. If you can get that down in your life, you'll become a fully devoted follower of Jesus, one in whom when he sees your life, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for listening to me. I hope Revelation 17 makes a whole lot more sense right now. To God alone belongs all the glory. I'm nothing. He is everything. Now let me turn it over to Jen Houston for our final remarks and our hope gift. Thank you so much, David. It's my honor to share with you about this week's hope gift. It goes to Project Freedom, which will be the first in the Carolinas emergent services to women and children coming out of human trafficking. We are so excited to partner with this ministry right here in our region who's truly making a difference. Our hope gift to Project Freedom is $40,000. Thank you so much for your partnership with us in helping us remain committed to giving 25% away off the top of every dollar that comes through our doors. It's because of your generosity we're able to sow into ministries like Project Freedom. And if you'd like to give to our ministry today, you can click the button on the screen. You can give through our app or our website, or finally, you can mail a check to 4500 Cameron Valley Parkway, Suite 400, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28211. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and worshiping with us today. We really hope to see you next week. <music>